Okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last class. I have the, uh, the floor plan that you guys were supposed to be working on. Yours may not be quite the same. It might be a little bit different. You may be missing a few pieces. It's okay. Uh, we're just going to keep pressing forward. If yours is a little bit different, not the end of the world. Uh, but I want to talk through um, a little bit more two-dimensional drawing, and then we'll get into some of the 3D commands, and we'll actually build this more in three dimensions. So I'm going to continue starting uh, today just in the top view. And I want to start working on kind of understanding elevations and or where the windows might fall on a wall and that sort of thing. So I find it helpful to do a little bit of more 2D drawing and to kind of establish what that wall is going to look like. Uh, and then I want to ultimately teach you uh, a really important tool. It's under part five today. It's called the project command. And I think that's one of the most important things that you can learn early on in Rhino. Uh, and so I'll work you to that point today. So I'm going to start first by drawing um, one of the elevations. It doesn't matter which elevation I, I work on. But essentially, I want to be able to draw a window. The reason that I care about this window is really all about the height of the window. I don't need much detail, but I need to understand where that window is going to appear on the wall. Uh, so if I established a line, I'm going to use my uh, smart tracking. Oh, a couple things. One, uh, they still haven't fixed the problem with the missing lines. So if you um, are missing lines, go to Tools and then Options. And at the very, very bottom under View here, you can click on Open GL. Uh, and then you want to uncheck this GPU tessellation box, because that's what's causing the lines to disappear on you. Um, so make sure that's unchecked. I already did that today, so mine was already set beforehand. But just as a reminder to do that. OK, so now I want to also make sure that some of my um, object snaps are turned on. I, they weren't on by default. So I'm going to check end, mid, and perpendicular. Those are the three that I tend to leave turned on all the time. And then I can go ahead and use a polyline. So I'll come down here to my polyline tool. And I will smart track to this first corner. So I'll pull down a bit. And it doesn't really matter how far. I could specify a distance. Uh, but it, it, like I said, it really doesn't matter how far. I'll put it there. I'll smart track over and snap this down. Now notice, because I have perpendicular turned on, I can actually snap to being perpendicular to my smart track. So I haven't drawn anything. Uh, it's just snapping to be perpendicular there. And once again, I'll come here and I'll pull down until that snaps right there. When that's done, I'll go ahead and press Enter on the keyboard. And now that line is done. This line is going to serve as the bottom of my, or the finished floor height of this particular building that I'm working on. So from there, I need the upper line, or, or where the top of the, the wall would be. And so a typical ceiling is 8 feet. We could do it at 8 feet. We could do it at 9 feet. It really doesn't matter. But I'll use the offset tool. This is what we used last class. And part of my um, repetition of these things is to remind you of the tools as we start to get into it. I know Monday was a holiday, so you forgot everything we did last week. So we have to kind of get back in the flow of things here. I'm going to use the offset tool to create a second line up above here. And that second line is going to be, uh, we'll call it 9 feet away from this first line. And I'll do that by going up to Curve and then Offset, Offset Curve. The alternative would be to type into the command line here, Offset, and then press Enter on the keyboard. Either way, we'll get there. Now my distance is currently set to 1 inch. That's way too narrow. I need to increase that. So I'm going to set my distance at 9 feet. And I'll do that by typing 9 and then the apostrophe sign. And I'll press Enter on the keyboard. And now my distance is much more the way it should be. So I'll go ahead and snap it on the upper side of the line there. And that then gives me two lines there and there. I could do a little bit more. I could go back to my polyline tool. I could fill in that line on the end. I'll press Enter. I'll come back to the polyline tool. And I could do that line to represent that corner. I could go back to the polyline tool and do that line to represent that corner. Now, when it comes to placing the window here, I need to know where the head height would be and how big the window is going to be. Those are kind of the two critical things. So I'm going to do a couple things to help myself out here. First thing I'll do is I'm going to establish a line down here 
at where the head height of the window would be. So we'll, we'll make it a tall window. We'll say that the, uh, the head height is at eight feet. So I'll come down by one foot. So I'll use smart tracking to come down by one foot. And then I'll just draw a line um, straight across the top of the building. I'll end up deleting that line a little bit later. Next thing would be the height of the window. So we'll do a window at maybe, I don't know, five feet. So I can use the offset command to do that. So we'll go in to curve, offset, offset curve. My distance this time will be five feet, so five apostrophe. And I'll go ahead and press Enter. And there's that window. Or excuse me, there's the bottom of the, the window, the sill of the window. So I have the location up here on my plan. So now it's really just a matter of drawing in the window. I'll come down here to polyline. I'll use smart tracking. I'll come down and snap. Nope, it doesn't want to snap for me. Um, let me snap to the intersection of those two. So I did smart tracking in two directions. And then we'll go to perpendicular. We'll come over to right there. We'll come back up and we'll close that. And that then is my window. The alternative would be to use the rectangle tool. Instead of drawing a polyline all the way around, I can do that in very much the same way. I'll use smart tracking for those two points to get my starting point. And I'll use smart tracking with those two points to get my end point, And that then gives me that rectangle. You guys will have windows over here on the side. I didn't end up putting those in here. Let me throw a few windows in. Oops. Sorry, wrong. There we go. All right. So I can do the same thing here using the same window heights. It's just a matter of taking my polyline and I'll smart track from that end point there to right there to start. We'll come down to perpendicular. We'll come over. I know those windows are four feet, so I could just type in four feet. That's the other option. But sometimes the smart tracking is a little bit easier. There's a window. Uh, and now I could just copy this window because I know they're six inches apart, so I'll copy. Remember, I'll use smart tracking for copy, so I'll hover over this point, move my mouse to the left, type in six inches, and now I'm copying from a point six inches from the corner of my window. And I can then snap to right there. So at this point, I could go ahead and I could delete this line here that represents the head height of the windows and this height here that represents the, the sills of the windows. So I'll select both of those. I held down Shift when I selected to be able to select both. Remember, if you accidentally select something that you didn't want, you can always switch and hold down the Control key and then deselect a particular piece. So I've got those two lines. I'll go ahead and delete them. Now, of course, in real life, There'd be trim around the windows. There'd be all kinds of detail. I don't really care about the detail. All I care about is the placement of these windows in the elevation view. And so we're going to use those to our advantage. Now, before I move on, I should probably draw the other side over here. But I'm going to leave that for you because you guys don't need to uh, watch me draw it again. But just be aware that sometimes you have to draw more than one elevation. So at this point, I've drawn the elevation. I've done part one. I'm going to move on to part two. And I'm also going to start looking at this not in the two dimensions anymore. I'm going to start moving into the third dimension uh, on this particular drawing. So the first thing that I want to pay attention to and introduce you to today is that we have, just like in AutoCAD or in Illustrator or in InDesign or any of those common applications that you're used to, we have the ability to assign objects to a particular layer. And I'll tell you right now that Rhino's layering structure is very robust, but it's also absolutely critical when you go down the road. Learning to keep things on layers will save you when you apply materials, because you can apply materials by layer. So you can say, all these objects put this material on it. So it'll save you time. But also, it's not uncommon by the end of the semester when you're doing your final project to have several hundred layers in a particular drawing. You might have several thousand layers in a particular drawing. So organization becomes really important. Right now, does it really matter? No, because we're doing something rather simple. But if you get in the habit of being organized, it will help you down the road. So to access the layers window, 
Uh, I'm going to look over here on the right side. We have properties showing by default. The next one over is kind of a pie shape piece. It's a red, white, and blue piece of pie. If you click on that, it will open up the layers tab here. And by default, you probably have a default layer and then layer two, uh, let's see, I have two, three, six, and seven. I don't know why it's two, three, six, and seven, but those are my default layers. Yours might be a little bit different. Um, you might be one, two, three, and four, et cetera. We are currently only using the default layer, is my guess. Um, and so we can, we can find out what layer something is on if we wanted to by going to properties, selecting a particular object. So there's something that I just drew. And in the properties tab here, we can come down to layer and it can be, oh, it's default. And okay, that's what I expected it to be. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start to organize my file just a little bit. And so I might have the default layer here. If I click on it, I can actually rename it. So I'll double click and I'll change the text. I'm going to call this 2D drawing. And so we'll set that up as the 2D drawing layer. And I could take all of these objects and I could put them on that layer by selecting them first. So I did a selection from left to right to select everything. And then right click on the 2D drawing layer and say change object layer. It's right here under the shortcut menu. And that puts all of the objects on the 2D object layer. So that's fine. Now I could be a little bit more specific, however. I could have a layer, and we'll use layer two as the example here, for floor plan. I could also have a layer, we'll use layer three here, as elevation. And I can rename that to be elevation. And I could then take just the floor plan and move it onto just the floor plan layer. So again, select the floor plan layer and say change object layer. And now that's on just the floor plan layer. Likewise, I could take the elevation layer and I could right click on elevation and say change object layer. And so now I could turn on and turn off the floor plan and the elevation separate from one another. So I could click the light bulb here to turn off the floor plan. I could check, click on the elevation view to turn on and turn off the elevation view. So that's nice. And this should look relatively familiar. If you've worked in AutoCAD, you've done this before. Now here's something that's a little bit different than AutoCAD that Rhino will allow us to do, is instead of just living on a layer by layer basis, we can actually create sub layers in Rhino. So I can take the floor plan and the elevation layer and I can make them a sub layer of the 2D drawing layer. So I can take floor plan, drag it up on top of 2D drawing, and you now see I get that little downward facing triangle and floor plan is listed below the 2D drawing layer. I could take the elevation layer that I just created, drag it up onto the 2D drawing layer, and now the elevation is a sub layer of the 2D drawing layer. So the advantage here when you start to get big files with lots of layers, hundreds of layers, if you organize well and you have sub layers and you can have sub sub layers and sub 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 layers, you can start to be really organized about being able to turn things on, turn things off, et cetera. So I can turn all of the 2D drawings off by turning off the 2D drawing layer, or I can individually turn off just the floor plan and just the elevation. So I have a lot of flexibility there. Layer six here, or the next layer down, I'm gonna go ahead and double click and I'm gonna change that to be 3D um, model. And I'll leave that as 3D model. And layer seven, I don't need, so I'll go ahead and delete that layer altogether. Now the 3D model layer, I want that to be the current layer so that when I draw from now on, objects are going to start appearing on that 3D model layer. I'll do that by clicking right next to the name, and you'll see that this check mark will move down to be on the 3D model layer. A Couple other things to point out about the layers. They're relatively self-explanatory, but there is a lock icon next to any one of the layers. If you click on the lock icon, it will lock that um, object. That means you cannot select it. However, you can snap to it. So you can't select it, you can't delete it, but you can still snap to it and reference it. You can smart track to it, etc. So sometimes it's a good idea to lock individual layers so you don't accidentally move them. I'm going to leave them unlocked for right now. Next to the locks, 
are a bunch of colors. My colors happen to be set all as black. I think yours by default might have some colors to it. I created this file on a previous version and it's migrated its way forward. But these colors are just viewing colors. They don't have anything to do with rendering. It's just if I wanted to see, say, the floor plan and I wanted that floor plan to be in red, I could change the color to be in red and then my floor plan is going to show up as red. I could change the elevation to, oh, I don't know, uh, blue and the elevation would show up as blue. So it's just a view color. And some people like to work in lots of colors so they can see you know, one object versus another object or what object is on what layer, et cetera. Um, most of the time, I work with just my objects in black, and I don't worry about it as much. But that's a personal preference. You guys will sort through that. I'll leave these colored for right now so that you can see them. Um, but I just want to point out that that is, in fact, an option. So we've covered part two of the exercise. And now that we've covered part two, we're going to move on to part three, which is a command called rotate 3D. And this is our first foray into the 3D world on this particular project. So first off, I'm going to move out of the top viewport and change into the perspective viewport. So I'll double click on the top view. And then I will double click on the name here, perspective, so that I can get myself into the perspective view. A couple notes about the perspective view here. I can zoom in and zoom out using the scroll wheel. I can also right click and hold to orbit around my objects. So in SketchUp, if you've worked in SketchUp, you hold down the middle mouse button to orbit. In Rhino, you right click to orbit. So it's a little bit different. So there I am. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to use the rotate 3D command to essentially stand up this elevation view. So first off, I'm going to initiate the command by going up to Transform and then choosing Rotate 3D. It's important to point out that there are two rotate options in Rhino. There is a regular rotate option and there is a rotate 3D option. The regular rotate keeps your drawing in plane and allows you to rotate like this. We'll cover that in a little bit more detail later. The rotate 3D option instead of just rotating around in a circle, will allow us to actually stand up this particular object. So I'll go up to Transform, and I'll choose Rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type Rotate 3D into the command line, and that would initiate the command the same way. So the first thing the command line says is to select the objects to rotate. So now in its current orientation, selecting these objects is a little bit challenging. I'd have to you know, kind of do it in pieces, say like that. If I want to make my life a little easier. Don't forget that you can orbit, orient your selection a bit, and make it easier to select. So don't forget that you can change the view that you're looking in. So I've now selected the objects that I want to rotate. I'll go ahead and press Enter when done. There we go. Now the next thing that this asks me, and by the way, I'm going to do this multiple times. So if you get it lost, don't worry. I'm going to go back and do it again. Uh, the first thing that's going to ask me is the start of the rotation axis. And so what it's, what it's trying to tell me is if I were to draw a line, wherever that line would be, that's what I want to rotate around. So in this scenario, if I wanted to stand up this wall, I need a line that's at the bottom of the wall so that it would stand up along that line. So in this case, I would start my rotation axis here. And I would end my rotation axis right there. Once I've done that, it asks me a reference point. So I'll reference the top of the wall right there. And now I can stand up, stop, I can stand up that wall in the third dimension. If I want it to snap to vertical, I have two options. I can turn on ortho, and it will snap right up to 90 degrees. The alternative with ortho off would be to hold down the shift key on the keyboard. And that will cause me to, to stand up perfectly vertical, like that. And we can kind of verify that by orbiting around and saying, yep, that looks like it stood up just right. So the biggest problem with Rotate 3D is that people pick the wrong rotation axis. So in this scenario, I could go back to Rotate 3D, sorry, Transform, Rotate 3D, and people will pick this axis first. Well, when you do that, then you're going to start rotating around that point which is not the direction you want to go. So you always think of what is the line that I want to rotate around. And so we'll go back one more time, and I'll go back to my Rotate 3D. 
I'll pick the line along the bottom of this, there to there. My reference point is just al along the wall itself, and we'll stand that up. I'll hold down Shift, and it will jump to perspective. Make sure that you hold down Shift so that it jumps to 90 degrees. You don't want to try to guess at what 90 degree is. is. Oh, that looks like 90. Oh, wait, now it's off. And then you're trying to compensate and figure out where that 90 degree is. So make sure you actually do rotate up to the full 90 degrees right there. And there it is. So now I have my elevation standing up on edge. I have my floor plan down here on the ground. It's time to start pulling those pieces and working with those two to create a three-dimensional object. So we've moved on into part four of our exercise for today. And that this part is actually going to be creating some three-dimensional objects. So I'm going to confirm over here in my layers that I am on the 3D model layer. So when I create these objects in the first place, they're going to uh, appear on the 3D model layer. I'm then going to come over and take a look at my drawing. And so this floor plan here that I've been working with, if I were to click on one side, do I get the full selection? Do I get all the way around my objects? In this case, I get all the way around my objects. Now, some of you will have something like this happen where you'll go to select an object and you'll get, wait a minute, I only get one object. Or maybe you'll get a piece. Or maybe it'll look like it's almost done, like that, but I'm missing that little piece there. If that's the case, you want to work your way around your objects, find the piece that isn't connected, Select it, so I'll hold down Shift here, and then go up to Edit and then Join. You could press Control J on the keyboard, or you could type in Join on the command line. Well, I'll get you there. When you join those objects, look at the command line. It should say two curves joined into one closed curve. That's the key word that you're looking for, one closed curve. So sometimes, you get this. Nine curves joined into one open curve. No, nope, that's not what I want. And so go back and look at your drawing here and see if there's a piece that wasn't selected. So in this case, that piece wasn't selected. I'll go back to Edit and then Join. And now I have two curves joined into one closed curve. The reason that I care about this is because the extrusion is going to be much cleaner when it's a nice closed curve. The other thing that can happen I'm showing you these examples because these are all things that have happened in the past. Is that you'll go to select your curve and you'll say, OK, well, let me take all of these there. All right, that looks good. Let me join it. Hmm. 11 curves joined into one closed curve. And one, oh, in this case, it worked out OK. So I can't even screw up on purpose, right? All right, take that. Trying to, trying to mess this up. All right, so there we go. Two curves joined into one open curve. OK, well, but when I select it, it looks like the whole thing is closed. So what happened? Well, in that scenario, I had two lines right here. And so those two lines overlap. And they look like they're the same line, but there's actually two lines. So sometimes you actually will have to explode. So I'm, going, I'm typing in explode, or I could go to edit and then explode. And then go through and manually say, OK, this plus this. See, there's my two lines on top of each other. Plus this, this, this. And I'll work my way around the rest of the way. I'm holding down Shift while I do this. Oops. There we go. Join. 10 curves joined into one closed curve. All right, we're good. We're ready to go. So there are some tricks to making it happen. It will make your life better if you don't have these kinds of mistakes before you move on. So now that I have those 
joined and ready. This side is also joined and ready. I'm going to use a command called extrude. And I'll do an extrude um, using the, so we, we've previously been working in curves. Next one I'm going to go to surface extrude curve. So there's logic to this. Curves, the next step up would be surfaces, the next step up after that would be solids. So we're going to start with the curve and we're going to move over into surface. So surface extrude curve straight. The other, uh, the, the, the key command for this is just extrude CRV for extrude curve. And it's going to ask me to select curves to extrude. Now technically, I could select all the curves at once. I'm going to do them as separate operations so you see me repeat this a bit. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and click on this wall. Select curves to extrude, press enter when done. Okay, I've selected the one I want to extrude. I'll go ahead and press enter now that I'm done. And you can see that it's starting to build this in the third dimension. Extrusion distance, this is how long it is. This should look somewhat familiar. There's a both sides option if I wanted to extrude both ways. It's kind of like an offset in a way. Now the third option over here is solid. Do I set this to solid yes or no? So if I keep it as no and I create this wall, you'll see that the wall is going to be hollow, which may or may not be desired for you. In the case of what we're doing today, I think it's better to keep it solid. So I'm going to go back and do this again. I'll go to uh, Surface, Extrude Curve, Straight. I'll select my curve. I'll press Enter. And this time, I'm going to change Solid to Yes. And then I'll go ahead and type in my height, which was at 9 feet. Or I can, in fact, snap to my elevation that's right over here to get the 9 feet. Either way. So I could type 9 feet, and that would do it there as well. When you're working with an Extrude command, if you want to go in the opposite direction, if you want to go down, it doesn't ask you which side you want, like the offset. Do you want this side or this side? You would have to type in negative and then your distance to make it go down. Obviously, I don't want it to go down, but I'm trying to point that out. So I'm going to continue with the extrude here. I'm going to make sure solid is set to yes. I'm going to snap to the top there. And there is my first wall. And you can see at the top here that it's nice and solid. And that's what we're after. It's much easier to fill in the top of the wall when you do the original extrusion. If you do the extrusion and it's empty, going back and filling it in is a lot more work. So it's much better to do it all in one operation. So I have that one extruded. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to extrude this piece as well. So I'll go back up to surface and then extrude curve straight. I'll pick my object. There it is. Press Enter when done. Now I once again want it to be set to solid as yes. And then I need to type in the height, or I could snap to my uh, existing wall right there. And so that snaps in. So you can see, pretty easy to, to pull up those walls once you have the curves to pull them up. So I have those curves pulled up. And now I would like these windows to be on that wall. So in the world of Rhino, and we're moving from part four into part five of this, in the world of Rhino, we could draw on this wall if we wanted to, to just draw the windows on. I could say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to take this elevation view, and I'm going to move it so that it's over here on the wall itself. I could do that. But sometimes this wall isn't just a flat plane. In the world of Rhino, remember, we have the ability to make anything curve in any direction we want. We could make the wall bulge if we wanted to. So sometimes we need to be able to take one object and essentially throw it onto another object. And we're going to use that. Uh, we're going to use a command called project to do this. And I say throw because that's kind of a casual way of doing it. But what project is doing is it will take this object and push it right along here on a straight line until it intersects with the surface and draw a brand new matching piece. So there's a couple tricks about how this one works. And in order to start with the project command, I'm actually going to back out of seeing the perspective viewport as my whole viewport. And I instead want to see all my viewports at once. So I'm going to look here. And I'm going to have the top, the perspective, the front, and the right side. And I'm going to have the ability to look at all of these views at one time. 
So in order to tell the project command which axis you want to project onto, we're going to use our viewports to set that one up. So in, the, in this case here, I want this object to end up on this surface. So if I look down here in the front view, I'm seeing that object. And I can see the surface, sorry, I can see that surface there as well. And if I were to project straight through the viewport, exactly as I'm seeing it, this object, and I want to push it back till it touches that object, that's the right viewport to initiate this command. So I'm going to do this using the front viewport, not the perspective viewport. You will get into trouble if you keep the perspective viewport the active viewport. And I'll show you what will happen in just a second. So let me show you the, the projection. We're going to make sure that I'm in the front viewport. I'm going to go up to Curve, Curve from Objects, Project. Alternatively, I could just type in Project. Project is a common enough command in the world of Rhino. You're going to learn Project, and you're just going to type it in all likelihood. But it's Curve, Curve from Objects, Project. I'll click on it. And it's going to say first, select curves and points to project. So I'm going to select, I'm going to do this one at a time. I'm going to pick just this window. And I'll go ahead and press Enter when done. Next, it says select surfaces or polysurfaces or meshes to project onto. So I have a lot of variability there. I want this polysurface as my projected surface to project onto. I'll go ahead and press Enter when done. And when I do that, if you watch the perspective view, you'll see that it then creates a line where it intersects the first surface, where it intersects the inside, and it actually also projects all the way through the object to these two points, there and on the outside right there. So it projected all the way through these objects, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. So what happens if I don't initiate the project command in this front view, perpendicular, going the direction of the view here? If I'm in the perspective view and I initiate project, I'll go up to uh, curve, curve from objects, project. I'll select my curve, there we go. I'll select my object, there we go. And I'll press Enter. And it'll say, the projection missed the selected objects. Because it's projecting perpendicular to this view. So it's trying to take that object and push it straight back till it intersects with something. So we really have to make sure that we project through this. I don't know if I can fake it. Let me see if I can um, get the viewport set up so that it would project. And I can illustrate this a little bit better. I don't know that this is going to work, but I'm going to try. So I want to project this onto that surface there. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, I was hoping that I could illustrate it, but it, it, it still missed. So the key here is when I do the projections, always be in the view that is perpendicular to the way you want to project. I wonder if I could, sorry, give me a second for a tangent. Uh, let me see here. No, it's not worth the tangent. OK, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to project this one on that surface there again. So I'll be in the front view. I'll go to project, curve, curve from objects, project. Select my object first, there it is, onto this surface, and I'll go ahead and press Enter. Now in this scenario, it gave me the first two curves exactly as I wanted. But then it also gave me a partial curve where that doorway is. Well, I didn't want a window cut in that doorway. I didn't want the one at the back end. So I'm going to go ahead and select it and just press the Delete key, and that one goes away. I could come back here to this window, and I can project that one. So let me come back to this view, again in the front view, project onto that surface. I'll press Enter, and that gives me those two. One more time, project this onto that, and that'll create it. The other problem that people run into is they do the project, and they start in the front view with all good intentions, and then it says, select surfaces to project onto, and they say, oh, it's this surface here. Well, guess what? You just changed viewports, so you lost the projection. So everything has to be done in that front viewport. So project, first one, second one, 
and there they are. So at this point, I already have the windows outlined on my building. I'm going to go ahead and make the perspective view big again. And now it's time to cut holes through, this, uh, through these walls. I can do that using a variety of methods, some of which take more effort, some of which take less effort. I'm going to show you a couple different ones. Um, the first one that I'm going to show you is something called make hole, which I think if it works for you, it's the easiest strategy. And so that's available under the Boolean tools. So if I come down here on the right side, there's two spheres that are kind of glued together. Underneath that, so if I click the little triangle next to it here, and I come all the way down, there is something called make hole. It looks like there's a white line and kind of a wall looking thing. Alternatively, you could type make hole into the command line. And the first thing it's going to ask is to select planar closed curves. So that essentially means this, the outline of the window. It's a planar closed curve. Press enter when done. There we go. Select a poly surface. That's my poly surface. Essentially, that's my wall. Depth point. So in this case, I want to go all the way through the window. So I need to either know the thickness of the wall, which was 6 inches, or snap to the back edge of the wall, which is right there, one or the other. And when I do that, it'll cut right through my wall for me. So it's pretty easy. I'll do it again. So one more time, make hole. Or, of course, I could come up here. Uh, I could go to the Boolean tools and choose the make hole tool. There it is. Select planar closed curves. There it is. I'll press Enter. Select a surface or poly surface. There it is. Depth point. This would be at, say, 6 inches. And that'll then create the hole for me. Now, you see that it says depth point. Well, I could go back through this, and I could say I want this. There's my poly surface, but I don't want to cut all the way through. I don't want to go the full six inches and cut through. Hold on one second. I'll come back to you. I want to cut only three inches through. I could type in three inches, and it's going to ask me which direction. I want it to go in, and then it cuts like a little niche into the wall for me. So I don't have to do it just to cut all the way through something. I can make a partial hole. You got a question in the back. So when you do the extrusion, so if you go back to the extrusion, I'll do it over here. When I when I go up to um, surface extrude uh, sur uh, surface extrude curve straight. There's my curve. I'll press enter. That's where I have the option to change from uh, solid no to solid equals yes. And so I want solid to equal yes, and that then makes the solid object. So, oh, you're seeing it. it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sometimes I forget things. You're seeing it like this, right? So this is in wireframe mode, which is the default. I, I apologize. Sometimes I forget that you guys don't know this stuff yet. Um, we want to switch the view mode from wireframe into shaded. So it's the little triangle where it's next to perspective. You were in wireframe. You want to go back to shaded. Now you can see it. I apologize. Thanks for stopping me on that. So if for some reason the make whole command wasn't working, the alternative would be to use these objects that we created as trims. So we worked with trim last class. If I go here and pick the trim command, select cutting objects. That would be this curve that goes around. There it is. I'll press Enter. And then I could actually cut that part of the wall. Now I'd repeat using the inside of the wall right here. That would be my cutting object. And I would like to get rid of that piece. So now I've cut through the wall. Now the wall itself is still, sol uh, still hollow inside. So after I've done that, I really need to take this curve, I'll hold down Shift, and that curve, and I need to make a surface that goes all the way around the inside. With those two curves selected, we've already done this once. We can go up to our uh, surface and then choose Loft. It asks me the direction. The two arrows just have to be pointing generally in the same direction, which they are. And I'll go ahead and press Enter. The default options are fine. And that then fills in the inside of the wall. That's a lot more work. There's many more steps to do it. So if make whole works, that's a far better strategy.
to creating it. Sometimes you end up having to do it this way. So I can do it a little bit faster because I've spent some time working in Rhino. If I select both the curves at once and then I type trim, I can get rid of both pieces, press enter, and then type loft, and enter one more time, and one more enter, and then it fills it in. So it's not that many extra steps, but it is, it is a few extra steps. So I would encourage you to play, with, play around with it, work your way through, see if make whole will work for you or won't work for you. Um, those, are, those are kind of the big options that I want you to get through. Uh, let me just double check here. Okay, so once you're done today, and you've cut your holes through the building, oh, the other thing I should add is, um, in this scenario, I would, I would build in the tops of the doors. So we've cut through things to cut out the windows. The doors don't have a top or a head on top of them. We'll just use the box tool right here. We'll go from corner to corner, and then we'll make this line up with where the windows are. So there's one. I'll come back to the box tool, and we'll go from there to there. Same thing, we'll make it line up with where that window is. One more time with the box tool from there to there. And that builds out the tops of those. So the goal here is to learn how to cut things through, make sure the project works, then cut through your objects. When you're done, I want you to capture this to file just like you did last time. So you go to the little triangle here, and we'll go down to capture to file. This will let you save a JPEG of what you see on the screen. That's what you'll post uh, as your exercise for today. You have the rest of the period to, to work through and to do that. Make sure you save the Rhino file. So go to file and then save as well so that that Rhino file is saved. We will again work with this next class when you get back on Monday. On Monday, we're going to jump over into the world of V-Ray and go through some V-Ray stuff and some basic materials and kind of starting to understand that. So I will always be weaving in some V-Ray along the way. Uh, you'll find that at the beginning of the semester, it's weighted more toward Rhino and learning how to make things. And towards the end of the semester, it's weighted a little bit more toward V-Ray and learning how to make them render. Um, but I always try to mix them in. So you'll have a little bit of V-Ray, then we'll go back to Rhino, then you'll have a little bit of V-Ray, then we'll go back to Rhino. Um, so there's always a little bit of that mix. Are there any questions about what we talked about today? No? Okay, I'll let you guys start working. Uh, and if you have questions, let me know.